it's such a great experience to be here with you uh, today because this, is, as Terrace had mentioned, is, is a really meaningful piece of work. And it's one of the things that we've been able to take a lot of our past experiences and continue to learn about what the issues really are and how we can really make a difference. So when I, I would think about you know, retirement and what you do in your next phase, it's um, one of the things that has really resonated with me is the ability to really do something that is so meaningful. But to do that, it's important to really understand some of the context. So if you could go to the next slide. And I'm gonna be talking about Baltimore, but this is a problem that is not just, uh, not unique to Baltimore City. It is um, seen all over the country and, and really all over the world. And what you're looking at here is the, uh, the problem, the situation that demonstrates that there's a lot of inequity out there. And uh, this happens to be uh, COVID-19 test rates, positivity rates. So the darker colors uh, in orange are the areas where you have very, very high rates of COVID. And in the center, um, one of the things that I learned about Baltimore City, and I'm not originally from Baltimore City, so I've gotten um, learned quite a bit about what's happening, but in the center of the city, that's where you have the um, more well-off areas, the places that are able to access healthcare. That's where you'll see um, some of Johns Hopkins, where I come from, and uh, the areas where, where people don't really have an issue. But as you go out to the sides, both on the east and the west, that's where the problems are. Uh, next slide. And if you look at where vaccines are, you actually see a very similar story where um, the problems with, with COVID-19 are not where the vaccines are reaching. And this is really, really problematic. Next slide. So if you take a further view, you can see different types of disparities that are happening. So this um, over on the left-hand side, you'll see the uh, percentage of the population by race. And this is something that's, that's all over the news, but it's really playing out in Baltimore City uh, quite, uh, quite a bit. So if you look at the white population and just turn yourself to the, the purple bars, which are you know first or single dose, because it's the same for the second dose, but you have 41% of the population that's been vaccinated and less than half of the black population. And the black population is living in those areas that I showed you on the previous uh, graph where you see uh, uh, the highest rates of COVID. So that's problematic. And you see something very similar, uh, although to a slightly lesser extent in the Latinx community. Next slide, please. So why is this? And the, the important part here is that we can't just do surveys. You know, we can't just um, you know, expect that we can ask some questions and know what's happening. We have to delve into this a little bit deep, more deeply. And we've done, as, as Terrace has mentioned, and we'll talk about it in just a moment, we've done a lot of listening. And to that listening has shown us a lot of experience. And it's that hearing uh, the stories from people's own mouths that makes a big difference because otherwise you're just dealing with numbers and numbers really don't tell the whole story or enable you to appreciate some of the experience that you're getting. Next slide. So Terrace, did you wanna talk about sure, this? Sure, sure. And uh, one of the things I wanna do is kind of back up, not in slides, but I, I just want to say something real quickly. So this process that Lois is taking you through and taking a look at Baltimore, we began our discussions as a team during the flu uh, vaccine effort. 
And it's there that we really started to come together to understand the context of the community that, that you're looking at, the context of the city. One of the points that she touched on earlier was uh, the kind of center of the city. And I would point you as, as you're thinking back on that and where resources are distributed in Baltimore. Uh, there's a book called The L and the Butterfly. And it's written by a professor who was at Morgan at the time named Lawrence Brown. And he talks quite a bit about the context of Baltimore. And there are for, for retirees, I wanna give you a few books to think about. If, if I were giving a public policy, health disparities, health inequity course on this in brief, the couple things I'd have you take a look at is that book and then the one called Not In My Neighborhood. Because those two books combine to give you a good context of how the city uh, really got positioned to where it is now, both in terms of economic issues, because these issues combine, economic issues, crime issues, health issues, and how those issues really affect adjoining communities, whether it's Baltimore County. And Excuse even me, Terrace. Yeah. What was the first book that somebody just asked? So that the question. first book, the first book is called The L and the Butterfly. The L and the Butterfly. And here's what it really talks about, Tony. It talks about the fact that the L in Baltimore, the center of Baltimore that Lois pointed to, is really a line that goes from Hopkins to Harbor to Hopkins. <laughs> I want to do that again. It's from Hopkins to Harbor to Hopkins. So the L starts, Tony, up at Johns Hopkins University on Charles Street. And it circles down, comes straight down, but on a few blocks, both sides, St. Paul, Howard. And the resources of the city come straight down till it hits the harbor. And then it goes up to Hopkins University. And if you look at Baltimore, the vast majority of the dollars from government and support and redevelopment and housing is within that L. It's within that L. And surrounding the L is what they call in Baltimore, the black butterfly. And though I don't live there now, just as many of you in Howard County, I'm distant from Baltimore City, but I was raised in the black butterfly. And this is the parts of Baltimore that has the greatest distrust of institutions, issues with police. And I talked that through with him today, having met with the police commissioner today. This is where the tension exists and the crime exists and the health disparities. There is a single block in Baltimore, and Lois and I have talked about this, on Northern Parkway and Park Heights, where you can stand on one block, same street. And if you live on one side versus the other, there's a 25 to 30 year difference in your life expectancy. That's in Baltimore City on the same street. One side, primarily Jewish, 20, 25, 30 years longer, the other side, African-American in Baltimore, the disparities is that extreme on one block. And so these two books really give you the context of this city. 
because you have to know the context and often entities who mean the best jump straight to the data, but they don't understand what's the history of this town? How is it set up the way it is? Where are the resources flowing? Where are the problematic areas and why do those problems exist? And those are critical issues whenever you, in your retirement, thinking philanthropically, thinking about working with others, you have to understand the context before you engage. And if you don't understand that context, you're always on the wrong side of the street. So looking at those issues that she laid out and then going into the vaccine distribution inequity, she also alluded to the fact of, well, you know, there was a difference in terms of where vaccines were happening and or not in Baltimore. Well, understand that Baltimore City is a city of neighborhoods. Baltimore City is a city of neighborhoods. You can have an outstanding, wonderful community and walk four blocks and be in the worst place you could find in Baltimore. And so where the vaccines went in Baltimore, part of the reason around inequities is the vaccines didn't go where people of color live. The vaccines went to M&T Stadium. I go to M&T Stadium, both for games, I can afford it. But most black people don't. Most black people are not willing to leave their neighborhoods, walk two miles after parking, stand in line for two hours and have access to a computer. Are you kidding me? My church is in one of the most prominent neighborhoods in Baltimore City of African-Americans. 40% of the kids in my community, their homes don't even have internet, don't have Wi-Fi. They don't have internet in the school. So if you're going to ask people to register online, who, 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 who are these people you're talking about? So it was totally insensitive to put the sites in Camden Yards, to put the sites at M&T. So our process said, wait a minute, there are factors that influence. And what we started with was listening. We listened to people and we started that listening process working with the flu vaccine. We started saying, and the conversations got meshed between flu and COVID. And, and, and here's what I did. So we had in working with Robert Wood Johnson, six groups, two for African-Americans, two for Latinx and, and two for indigenous. So of African-Americans, I had the only group that I call the black church because those of you on this line who know the most segregated day of the week in America is Sunday. And so I had several churches and their congregations that I would talk to and with Lois's guidance have listening sessions. And they told us a lot. They told us about their fear, but first I set parameters. And my parameters that was no matter what they said, it was church. And what that means to you that don't know it, in my church, it's not a democracy. It means we're going to have order. That means I'm in charge. That means there will be no profanity. That means you can talk about your fears and there won't be condemnation. You can talk about your problems and I'm not going to allow anyone to judge you. So they told us. They said, we don't trust you. We don't want your vaccine. We don't like Hopkins. And I protected that lady online. And I was there. They <laughs> <laughs> and I've been in some of the roughest spots in Baltimore City with that little white lady, but I've kept her safe. She's still hey, in one piece. Hey, Taurus, even, even stepping back from that, uh, yeah. one, question, one question people had, maybe something you, were, you and Lois could uh, 
both respond to is how about even getting to the vaccine trials? I know uh, when the when they were doing the uh, clinical trials, it was issues about getting uh, proper representation from different groups. What the uh, you know, Lois can talk about that. Absolutely, okay. no, you mean that that made the vaccine? Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. That's that that was a real uphill battle, and uh, the the companies had to work really really hard to to get there. And one of the reasons that they had to work really hard is just what you see on the screen. All of these different, um, you know, histories and you know, history of mistreatment and a lot of skepticism as to like what are they really trying to do to us. <laughs> so you know, as much as uh, people wanted, you know, to be represented in the trials it was a real battle to be able to get adequate representation. Now, at the end of the day, you know, there was one of the biggest efforts that I've ever seen in years to be able to get the level of diversity that we had. And most of the vaccines, although not all of them, but most of them actually did get, you know, a fair bit of representation for, from African-Americans. Could they have done better? Absolutely, but but they did eventually get there. But they had but they had a big learning experience in how to get there. It's not having like all of these white doctors just send out advertisements and expecting people to come to the table. You really have to partner with the community and have people that they trust to be able to talk to people in the community about what the benefit is going to be, show that they're willing to do this themselves and talk about you know, what's gonna come out of all of it. People wanna be compensated for this because this is a, a brand new vaccine and we, don't, we didn't know a whole lot about it. So you know, there's risks that were being taken and a lot of discussion to get people to where they are right now. So did you get the representative uh, numbers, you think, or was it uh, still it's below? Actually, it's actually pretty close. It's not, um, it's not perfect. So in the U.S., you could look at representation of um, African-Americans being about 13%. The, uh, the trials had you know, close to 11 in one trial. I think it was 15% in another. So you know, they, they were close. You know, they weren't that far off. Would we have liked to have seen a lot higher numbers? Absolutely. And you also want to see a lot of higher numbers of people with underlying health issues, because that's also important. But um, the effort, at least, you know, it passed the red face test. So you could say that, you know, hey, look, you're in those those numbers that you know there are people that are just like you that did take the COVID-19 vaccine. You know, I, I would add to that, Tony, that one of the things that this process opened up around clinical trials was the dialogue uh, with with that community, with the pharmaceutical community. Um, I've had a chance over the past year to speak to researchers across the country. And it's because of the work that I've done with Lois, uh, the National Academy of Sciences, the Milken Institute, to several research entities and pharmaceutical companies who are looking not just around COVID, but with other drugs to do better in terms of clinical trials and their inability previously to engage with African-American communities uh, has caused them to, to come to us, to come to me for suggestions on how to do better. And uh, often the conversation that I have with them is a little is a little shocking because initially it starts out how are you like the vaccine hesitancy whisperer uh, mm -hmm. able to convince people 
to take these vaccines, starting with the flu. And when I tell them that I never try to, and I never openly try to convince anyone to take the vaccine, they're a bit shocked that what I attempted to do was bring science to the sanctuary and to bring people like Lois who had the appropriate sensitivity after we had some serious discussions and continue to, to bring that attitude uh, to the sanctuary where we could have real dialogue and people could be informed with facts uh, uh, versus the myths and versus what they were guided to via social media. So institutions are now still talking uh, to me about how, how to make this happen. And uh, one of the things that I do say as we go through the list of what's in front of us is that I would think that African-Americans after not only our history, but after the current inequities that I saw uh, traveling this country nationally and the disparities and the treatment that exists from hospital institutions across this country, if they weren't hesitant and distrustful, I would think they would be a bit abnormal because to have received the kind of treatment that many have, it would be a little strange for them to say, oh, now that you haven't paid any attention to my chronic diseases, and now that you've treated me <laughs> inequitably, you're coming at me with a needle and sure I trust you. Wow, that would really be strange. And so to understand that context first has enabled us to open up the door and have conversation. You see the kind of things listed but I want to say in terms of how they felt that how we view things, how populations view uh, trust, distrust, willingness to take a vaccine is not stagnant. Mm -hmm. Things can change. And I'm just going to talk about the, you know, political taboo here. There was a big change when Trump left office in terms of the African-American community's trust of the vaccine. There was a big change once the vaccine actually showed up. There have been some changes that I've witnessed not only in my congregation, but in congregations across the city. So these are listed, but remember these perspectives are not Stagnant. Next slide. So inequities. <laughs> um, so so this really demonstrates what I what I just talked about. And so this hesitancy isn't just about government, but I, I have to say, looking at the context of results of trial today, and it, it's about institutions, period. And, and this is one of the struggles that we're still having now because in the African-American community, and there are two groups that we talk about, one that we try to have greater control in, in, in dealing with and identifying and supplying this group with information, the younger African-American group, the millennials and below, those, uh, those who've had uh, you know, really adverse experiences or their friends or their family with institutions of health and police and government and you just name it. And then there's that group, of course. And then there's another group that I'm sure healthcare professionals and, 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 and others are dealing with as well, which is white Republican males. These are the two real hesitant groups. And so in dealing with that younger group, in addition to trust in government and trust in vaccines, it's not just about, and you, you can tell when people just don't know, when it, is it about Tuskegee? Please, please, it's, it's way beyond 
Tuskegee. And just starting the conversation there tends to be an annoyance, but it's really about what Lois put on this slide. It's really an access issue. Put the vaccine where I am. And on this access side, I would say, across this country, according to my research. And this is one of the issues why like Tony, who, who left IBM, this is why I left uh, AT&T as an executive to study this issue. And uh, so my doctorate focuses on this issue of health disparities and health inequities. And, and by far, even though I have a bivocation of, of, of two things that this consultant and as a pastor, by far the literature says to me that the greatest source of trust in the African-American community is the church. African-Americans are by far, according to the literature, some of the most uh, culturally religious people in this country. And so if you wanna go into a community, you must come in at the door. You, you have to know how to engage with the church. And though everybody may not be religious, that church, if it's community-based, it will have connections with all the other antennas and touch points in the African-American community that are so important. And so that piece, access, transportation, getting to the vaccine, being able to get into the internet, getting information, but information that comes through the right source. So, so Terry, trust. Yeah. Terrence, I got a, I got a question, uh, and it's from my sister. Said in Baltimore, did they ever think of involving the rec centers? Their families trusted the church and the rec centers. So, you know, one of the things, because in addition to uh, being a pastor and doing this consultant, I'm the chair of the board for something called Family League, which is Baltimore's local management board, and so. Tell your sister, one of the things that we've pumped money in and Family League gives about 25 to $30 million a year to the kind of issues that really go at addressing disparity issues. Many of the wrecks, unfortunately, Tony, have been closed. <laughs> now, one of the mind blowing things and, 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 and really our new mayor was so glad to hear day one when I, along with the CEO of Family League, was what were able to tell him about wrecks, far more wrecks that we were able to fund, get back going. So, so you want to fight crime in Baltimore? Here, here's a logical way to do it. Let's take down all the basketball courts. Let's shut down all the community centers. Let's shut down the wrecks. <laughs> wonder, wow, wow. So where, where are these kids going to spend their time? So one of the things we've been able to do is get a lot more Rex functional. That was an absolute excellent question. And she is so right because when we were kids, that's where the mentoring took place. That's where the relationships were built. And most importantly, that's where you got a meal at night. So kids were drawn to those rec centers. Next slide. So as we walked in this, there were value communities um, that uh, Baltimore City Health Department looks at, you know, with, whether we're looking at um, those with disabilities, Latinx, you know, Lois went over several value communities and one, uh, that we really took a look at was faith leaders. So, so Lois came up with a unique way to do this. And uh, I, I know proliferated through government now is the term of human-centered design. And I was determined once I left government to never stay up on any of what is used in government. It's kind of like agile, Tony. I never want to know about any of that kind of stuff. It's like once I leave, I don't want to know about it. But human-centered design is everywhere in government. And, and until working with Lois, I was never a believer. And basically what it is, is how about this novel thought? 
how about go to the people that are most affected and begin to listen and ask them questions that will help you with them begin to design what kind of process will answer the question. So this, we had several sessions with faith leaders. And during the flu campaign, I started out with just, you know, the pastors that I knew and bishops. But in this, I spread it out. And with the support of Baltimore City Health Department, we spread this out to an interfaith effort. Uh, some of my good friends who are rabbis went to them, got the Jewish community involved, the Orthodox Jewish community involved. Some of my friends who are imams, the Nation of Islam. We also got priests. So on calls, you have to you have to visualize this. On calls, you had the Nation of Islam with Orthodox Jewish rabbis, bishops pastors and fathers. Wow, wow, it felt like the UN. And from that process, what Lois was able to do and working with Micah is to come up with this drawing that uh, gave a picture, if you will, of our discussion. Our discussions, and this went from the biggest churches in the city, the mega churches, with, with five, 10,000 members to the community-based churches that have even further reach in terms of their impact on communities. And we talked about the importance of overall healing. And we talked about the necessity um, to come together and, 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 and make sure we give facts to congregations and how we go about building trust. So this gives you the view of that conversation and, and, and the communications uh, that we have. And, and to put things in the context that this is a experience of discrimination in terms of the folks that we're, we're really working to serve and how this is now an opportunity. We really feel that COVID, and we don't minimize the over 500,000 deaths that have occurred and deaths that have occurred within my congregation and, and, and burials that were not intimate and all the processes that we went through. But through the horror and pain of COVID, we've been able to find some ways to open some doors and make things better. And that's yes, what uh, is reflectable. Any questions? Can I just ask uh, Lois a question? Sure, uh, sure. So, so Lois, uh, how did you get engaged in this community effort with uh, Terrace? Because, like uh, Terrace said, there's certainly a distrust of Hopkins, and we've, you know, we've heard a lot more information recently about some of the issues about the uh, Hopkins himself and and the slaves he owned and things of that sort. So, and of course, we all know about the, uh, you know, Henrietta Lacks and some of the other history that's going on. Uh -huh. So. So how did uh, how did you get engaged, and how did you deal with some of the, the history that's going on in the city of Baltimore for, for hundreds that's, of years now? Yeah, that, that's a that's a really great question, and and to answer that, I think it's um, probably helpful to know a little bit more about my background and where I come from. So I actually work in the International Vaccine Access Center. So this issue of disparity happens every day in, in the work that I do. And it, it's always been very central to the work that I've done. As a matter of fact, it was disparities that actually caused me to leave the pharmaceutical industry, which I came from, to go to Hopkins to begin with, because it just was something that I viewed as an injustice. And so um, most of my work actually up until last year was uh, on an international basis. And uh, there's a woman, uh, Laura Lee Hall at National Minority Quality Forum, who had, I had been working with on flu vaccines. And um, she introduced me to Terrace and I'm not sure how, I, I actually don't really, really remember how we got matched up or how we met. But um, just hearing from him was just so powerful. 
And that's one of the things that I think makes all of the difference in the world is, is just the relationships that you form with working with people and getting a chance to be working with somebody that, you know, he, he knew I didn't know any, any much of anything about Baltimore when I came in, but was willing to, to teach me. And, you know, given my experience in other countries, I wanted to learn. Um, one of the th conversations that's been going on at Hopkins for actually quite a, quite a while, but, um, you know, more uh, recently, it's it's been more relevant, is that we really do need to be playing a bigger role in our community. So the organization has been putting a concerted effort in, you know, making sure that we're paying attention to what's happening. And, um, you know, some of it, I think, just happened by chance coming in and uh, putting me in all of these uncomfortable, you know, admittedly, really uncomfortable situations. It's never a great feeling to go into some place that, you know, they don't like you. But then if you think about it, that's the same thing that these communities face every day. You know, discrimination and mistreatment. And I'd, I've got to say that I was never mistreated. That's, that's one of the things that I can say and, and something that I really value is getting to know the communities and getting to know where they're coming from and listening to, to their stories. You, you can really understand you know, why people are, are so bitter or why they don't wanna you know, take a leap of faith and, and do the things that you know, we think are right. And you know, if I was in that position, I'd be doing probably the exact same thing. So, you know, to, to how I got involved, I, I think in some ways it was just by chance, but it's in some ways, you know, embracing the injustice that's going on and knowing that we have things that we can provide. We have things that we learn. So every day I feel like I learn more from the community than I give. And, you know, I, I like to put people in, you know, enable people to, to be in the position to also give to other people, because I think that's where you're really going to make the, the difference, get that understanding together, get that, um, you know, spirit of partnership and spirit of, um, you know, I want to say equals, but in a lot of ways, we're way behind you know, sometimes Hopkins is, is viewed, you know, as, as experts in certain areas, but we're not expert at all. You know, there's a lot of people, like people like Terrace, people that, you know, with the other pastors that I'm working with, people in the, the community organizations and in the community that have enormous amounts of resources and are very, very capable of doing things. And I think you know, having this understanding is just important so you can learn to embrace what everybody brings to the table. I think that's spot on. And Tony, that's a great question. And though uh, Lois may not remember how this happened, I do. <laughs> uh, it was very purposeful for me. I will say a couple of things. I will say one that I've long since felt once I understood and came out of my national role and began to see the community. And the first time I saw Baltimore was after the death of Freddie Gray. I had no community outreach in Baltimore as a pastor. And that was so close to my church that it changed me. And once I saw Baltimore in its health condition and really got into the issue of not just studying disparities nationally in 50,000 foot view as the person who established the Office of Minority Health for Medicare and Medicaid, but seeing it from the ground level in my own city, one of the things that bothered me was the fact that we have this world-renowned research institution of Hopkins in such an unhealthy city. 
And so once I understood that Lois not only sat at a perch that was important uh, to this effort, and I believe the importance still hasn't been seen yet, that, uh, that if she was willing to listen and give me her ideas as well, and certainly to tame myself, to listen and understand where she was coming from. And once I saw that willingness to understand the lens and perspective of the other, then I purposely wanted to latch on and work with her uh, because of her status in the organization and because she was white and is. I find that too often in institutions, the community outreach person, the community director is often a person of color that has very little power or authority. But I felt if there was anyone that could influence an institution, it'd be the top vaccine lady who happens to be white. And what I've seen so far is I believe her influence in that organization can potentially have even greater benefit to the religious community and the communities of Baltimore. I don't think we've seen the extent that we can take this thing. And Hopkins is the major landowner in Baltimore City, the major power in Baltimore City. So if Baltimore is screwed up and Hopkins is the major landowner, what does that say about that institution? And that's how I felt from the beginning. So once I saw her and the potential I definitely wanted to work with her. Once I began to see myself and, and where I think institutions often go awry in working with community leaders like myself and pastors is they see us only as pastors. Not that we have other vocations that can be valuable. I was a healthcare executive so coming into this role with her now is a natural fit because of the mutual respect. Next slide. So <laughs> because of that, uh, that kindred spirit engagement and working relationship, uh, Lois and I uh, wrote an article uh, that uh, appeared, and I believe it was a health Journal of Communications or something like that, Lord, some fancy, fancy thing. And what we attempted to do was lay a roadmap to healthcare providers and others in working with vulnerable populations and working with not just vulnerable populations, but their trusted sources in those communities. And uh, this illustration kind of lays out the points that we went to in that document to understand, as I said earlier, the history and the context, to listen, to listen, to listen. Now it says and have empathy, but I, I, I said to the pharmaceutical industry and other uh, providers, if you can't get to empathy and the only reason you're doing this is ROI, that's okay, that's okay. I mean, if it's just a return on investment, it's okay. But understand the role of these pastors and what risks they are taking in working with you and try to engage with them in a way where they are sold on the idea first. Don't come to them with the cake baked and say, oh, get up in the pulpit and talk about we need more clinical trials. What? Unless I believe that that clinical trial, one thing that pastors don't do, they don't work for anybody but God. So they don't take orders well. And unless they are <laughs> convinced, <laughs> not at all, unless they are convinced that what they're doing is to the benefit of their community, they're not going to say it on Sunday morning. They're not going to say it. But once they're convinced, they know how to say it better than you ever will because they know that community. They are storytellers. 
They can build the best marketing plan you've ever found. And that's how you engage, create the partnerships and deal with this issue of power. Hey, I, I found out in Jackson, Mississippi, working with CMS that if you come into the wrong community, you don't share power, it's going nowhere. And if you don't learn how to share power with the communities that you work with, don't even go in there. Just because you have the money, just because you have the knowledge academically, if you don't know that community and how to sell your idea, it will fail. And so you have to share power and co-create the solution, as I said earlier. So oh. I knew I could pretty much take up all the time. Well, I know. I did, I, and one thing I was going to ask, the, uh, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat. But uh, since I haven't gotten any questions, then I feel like I can ask another question. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is for both of you. I mean, it's uh, always said that uh, nothing like taking advantage of a crisis to, to create change. But we know that as soon as this uh, crisis is over, uh, things will return to some sort of normalcy over the next yeah. couple of years. So yeah. this, this all sounds great now, but how do you all see uh, once the money starts dying down and the interest starts moving on to the next uh, crisis du jour, uh, what's your thoughts on how do you, can you maintain some of this that you've done over the past uh, year to kind of create the, uh, the momentum? Do you want me, do you want me to go first? Yeah, sure. <laughs> That is, that is the million dollar question. And if we don't do that, shame on us. Uh, one of the things that, so I was, I was doing a listening session the other day, it was with um, young men. And, you know, clearly a, a very you know, hesitant, hurt group. And you, one of the first things out of their mouths was, how do we know that you're not just going to go in and do this for you know two or three months and then you know you're off to the next thing and that is a real real issue because for one thing it, it's important to recognize that this isn't actually even about COVID-19. COVID-19 is, is in some ways an opportunity but it's about people's lives. And we need to recognize the project for what it is. It's not about a specific issue du, du jour. So in our planning, it's our responsibility to figure out who are the, the sources of funding? You know, what is the infrastructure that we need to be putting in place? Terrace and I are starting to think about, well, are there certain policies or certain procedures that we need to make sure are in place to, to formalize the role of the churches, to be able to do what they're doing right now and expand on that because we're never going to get to where we need to get to. The other big thing, and, and this is where I think you know, programs often often fail is that we need to build in measurement and we need to build in, you know, the ability to show our success along the way. So when we go out and we ask for money, we can show that, you know, maybe, maybe we didn't make huge, you know, inroads yet, but over a period of time, we would project that this is the way that, you know, we would expect to see results. And I think it's, the onus is on us to, to be able to tell that story as we go, that it's not just a, a one and done. You know, when they're doing the um, monitoring and evaluation plan, for example, for the health department, it's not about how many vaccines you get into people. Now that's, that's one measure, but it's really about have we made any you know, any inroads into understanding the community, understanding the strengths of the community, figuring out is there a way to not only look at this as you're bringing people in to get their COVID-19 vaccines, but you're bringing them in to, to counsel them on where they can get, you know, social services, where they can get food. Now, a lot of people know that already, but a lot of people don't. You can counsel them on healthy eating and, you know, making sure that they get tested for certain things and start to really build trust. 
So, uh, and I want to just add to that. I think one of the things that has stuck with me was the lessons of of Mark McClellan, uh, who's a former administrator at CMS. And what, what he taught me in building the new payment process for the healthcare system was to use those levers and always focus on the issue of return on investment. So Tony, when the money that's coming our way and, and come in the way of dealing with uh, COVID vaccine hesitancy now and disparities to some degree from the Biden administration, when it dries up, if before that we're able to time it and build relationships with hospital systems, I think that's the key, and demonstrate that there is a return on investment to building uh, trust and to dealing with real issues that were epidemic before the pandemic, like diabetes. To me, if you start dealing with those kind of issues and you can demonstrate that through the use of trusted sources, community health workers in a system of community helping itself, and it can become a return on investment to those hospital systems, you will get an influx of steady and sustainable cash from those entities because you're able to prove in a measurable way you can drive costs down. That's what CEOs of the four major healthcare systems in Baltimore, University of Maryland, Hopkins, MedStar, LifeBridge. That's what they think about every day. That's how they keep their jobs. It's all about the dollar. And if we can drive that process, if we can just get in right now while the emergency exists and begin in my mind through the influence of institutions like Hopkins, to spread their efforts to West Baltimore, to build relationships with the entities that I've mentioned, then I believe we can keep this thing going. And I believe we can build a model that can be a model for the nation. And, but it can start here because if you can do it in Baltimore, you can do it anywhere. This is a perfect spot for it. We got another question here uh, from Marge. It's that Marge Trinkle lady. She's Marge doing Trinkle. all right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. She, yeah, she, uh... <laughs> so she says, I what about prison? I worked for, for Baltimore City Public Schools for almost 40 years. So uh, I have a lot of time in the community. I got you. Yeah, she's kind of, she, we kind of got her into the audience. Uh, uh, <laughs> you got a ringer. I got a ringer in there. Yeah. But, but she asks about a, a really tough question, which is, what about people in prisons in Baltimore? There's a huge mistrust there because of bad experiences and also a lot of misinformation. And as you know, that's another reason why the community of Baltimore has a lot yeah. of distrust because of the whole prison system. Yeah, you, you, you're right, Marge. And um, one of the things that you find in the prison system is it's really hard, even with the bars and, and the stone or brick, to separate prison from community. Mm-hmm. Because they don't stay. I mean, they come back out. And so they're a part of the community that we're talking about. And if you build trust outside and inside, it, it, it's all collaborating and working together. Now, now my efforts haven't been from a pastoral perspective uh, focused on prison, even though you know, with, with members and community, spend a lot of time, visitations and that kind of thing. But I think it's about who you have trust in, who that institution, that person, that entity, whether in prison or not, that you have trust in. I've had members in prison, but because I took care of them, and when I say I, my church, they still had trust in me when they got out and were able to build decent lives once they were outside. So that recidivism 
uh, did not occur. I think that's a valid point, but it's about who they have trust in. Lois, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Or? No, it, well, just just from a, a healthcare perspective, it's it's really important that pr prisons are prioritized, just because they're congregate settings. It's um, as as Tara says, people get out. You know, hopefully the idea is that you're not there permanently, but it is a very high risk setting, and something that is important to to not ignore and set aside because that has influence on what happens in the community that they return to. And people remember how they were treated. And so we do have a responsibility. Uh, Baltimore City does have them on you know, the list of, of populations that are at higher risk. And um, they do have strategies to look at each one of these populations and ensure that they're bringing, in this case, vaccines uh, hopefully it would be more than that, but I can't uh, can't vouch for that at this point, um, saying that they're at least going to bring vaccines to those populations and ensure that there aren't uh, further outbreaks. Right, right. Okay, we have two other uh, questions. Well, they're, they're not questions as much, whether one of them's a question, one of, whether both questions in, in the fact that they, one, one individual, Frank, uh, said he has, he just launched his uh, company and he wanted to see if how he could partner with uh, Dr. King or or Ms. Perverdum or anyone this session. Uh, Hallelujah! So, <laughs> so, so should he just contact you? Rob? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no question. Okay. No yeah. question. Yeah, I'm getting some uh, notices for grant funding, but I don't have the network, you know, for eligibility. Recently, I have one for like $3 million for two years, but I needed a state, I mean, a city, uh, county, or township uh, government uh, to be eligible. Sure, I sure. contacted, I live in Georgia. I contacted my area. Nobody got back to me. So, you know. I, I understand. So, uh, you know, we'll make sure for me that you have uh, my contact information and we can talk it out. And if, it, if it's not myself, uh, I mean, my network is within this health disparities uh, area. Okay. I mean, so that's not a problem. We can talk okay, it out. Thank you very yeah, much. Same, okay. goes, same goes for me. We can give our thank email you. addresses. Yeah, we'll um, make sure every, you get everybody gets uh, the email address. Well, I don't know. Did, did you want me to do that or you want to just- yeah. uh, Okay. I don't. Ha I don't have. A I don't have a problem. Any anybody can find my email address anyway. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> Tell you they can track me. It, it has happened. Okay. Uh, <laughs> then we had a question from uh, Wesley Queen. He said, "Do you collaborate with the Baltimore Ministerial Alliance or the Greater Baltimore Committee?" So Bishop J. L. Carter is on speed dial for me, and he heads <laughs> that Baltimore Ministerial Alliance. Lois is planning the second pop-ups uh, now at his church. And the Ministerial Alliance represents several hundred churches in Baltimore, and I'm a member. And uh, all these sessions that you're talking about, uh, that we talked about, uh, Bishop Carter has been a part of them. And he's one of my most trusted advisors. I talk with him you know, more frequently than any other minister in Baltimore City. And that was before the COVID uh crisis occurred so the answer is yes uh, so anything else tony well i was gonna i could ask you more questions but is there more to you i know you can i know you can i can keep it keep us going with you. but uh is there anything else you want to say in your uh, in your lecture before we uh any more on your slides if you want or your Lois, you, you have anything else you want to add? There's, there's one thing that I want to um, be cl clear about is one of the, addressing disparities takes a lot of work. <laughs> um, it uh -huh. takes a lot of commitment. It is probably one of the most rewarding things you can ever do. Um, <laughs> I think I'm swearing at Terrace every single day that he keeps twice, <laughs> two, three times a day. 
<laughs> but you know, one of the one of the things that I, I can say is that it has been, you know, it really feels good to be able to get to know people, to understand what their issues are, to help, you know, work through some of the red tape and really think strategically about what can we do to, to make things different for people. And the I'm just amazed every day how many great ideas are right there, right in the community. And you know, all of you in the positions that you're in have the opportunity to really work with people and enable them to get their voice to be heard. And that's a really, I guess maybe it comes because because I do have an advocacy background, but one of the pleas that I have is, you know, if you have an idea or have a vision, work with people in the community and help them figure out, you know, how do we actually make things happen? Because a lot of times it's just a phone call or, you know, talking to the right person or, you know, figuring out how do we, how do we make things happen? But I am convinced that um, as much as we want to influence the government to make things happen, things can happen from the bottom up. And, you know, there's a lot of talent, there's a lot of know-how, a lot of um, things that we can really harness to make things uh, different from they are from what they are today. So you're uh, actually, what you just said uh, brings me to another question for you and uh, Terris and uh, Probably most of the people in this call are from from Howard County, and you know I think a lot of people from Howard County. Uh, some people go in the city quite a bit, but but a lot of people don't. Um, a lot of people, uh, it's some of it's fear, some of it's uh, you know they just don't want to be bothered. Some of it is uh, just everybody's tied up with their own day to day living, and and really don't focus as much on some of these issues. So I guess the, the question uh, I would have is, uh, so what, what are your thoughts for, for people here? And, I, and I'm not condemning anybody because we're all like that. We all get into, mm -hmm. into our, our own cocoons and things of that sort. But how can, what can people in Howard County do to kind of help, uh, participate and really be uh, engaged, even if they don't want to go you know, down into the city, into some of the areas where you are working? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll take that one and kind of close out that um, I think if there's one thing that uh, one of the things that COVID has certainly taught us is that we are connected. Um, I think in many respects, my congregation and others are right when they say uh, the amount of attention that African-Americans have received in terms of their health has skyrocketed because the health of one community affects us all. That if people of color or Republican white males don't take the vaccine, then that herd immunity that we were all talking about couldn't be realized. And so it's taught us that, hey, in some way, you know, the issues of Baltimore are often annexed because one of the ways politicians get rid of it, they come over, they, let's move them somewhere else instead of dealing with those issues. And over the past several years, I've had a unique experience of dealing with a population that felt as much, if not more, the way that Howard County residents can feel. And when I uh, really came into fellowship and friendship with uh, the Beth Tefilla congregation, Orthodox Jewish population, uh, and got to know them. And certainly those folk just felt that Baltimore, their rabbi Mitchell Wahlberg would say, my good friend, that the vast majority of them didn't know where my church even was had, had just like what Baltimore you I, I have to find my way to this place they couldn't do it because their view was that's not my problem we live in a very insulated community but there is such value 
in communicating and collaborating and coordinating efforts to feel each other's pain and to help and to work together. There's so much value in that. And uh, if you ask how you join and engage with us, I mean, we're pretty open. You know, we, we're giving our emails. Every time I give any talk, I invite help. And uh, boy, we need it, whether it's recommendations or ambassadors that we'll hire to help us or ideas in terms of our strategies, all that is needed. Uh, we, we, we need the help. And so this is not a spectator sport just to watch and say, what's going on over there? I could take that option. I don't live in Baltimore. I can do the same thing. But understanding that, that their pain is mine and I'm affected by my old community. And so uh, I, I hope that many of you take up the opportunity to a partner and, and to help us uh, in, in this process. And last thing I'll say, you know, when in government, Tony and I know that as, you know, many of us as the founders of this organization came out of government, one thing we cannot be is advocates. We, we just implement the policy. But a great freedom comes, and I've realized it, <laughs> because I don't work for the government anymore. And I can be an advocate now. And I can voice my opinion now. And I can say when I see injustice now, and I can say it behind the mic, and I can represent the interests of people with great freedom. And that is empowering. It really is. So this is something that I'm doing now that I do for free, even though I still want to keep getting paid, Lois that I would do it for free. And this is the kind of thing that uh, really helps in terms of locking into your passion. So I know we both really appreciate the opportunity to tell you about the things that we have done and are doing working together uh, for Baltimore City and its citizens. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Terrace. Lois, mm -hmm. any last words? I'd love to actually turn the question around to you. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear from any of you what you think. Because one of, one of the things is advocacy and, and engagement doesn't need to be big. It can be, but it can be in your own backyard. It could be on a broader scale. It could be you know, very deliberate, or it could be just small actions, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Anybody want to volunteer? Um, yeah, I will. Um, Thanks, for sir. example, like this uh, global, equity, global equity thing that I'm talking about, I was thinking about Sub-Saharan, like, you know, I come from Ghana originally, and um, I'm thinking ahead like uh, vaccine distribution. They don't even have them yet. But President Biden has said, once we get done here, he's looking uh, to you know, other places. Because unless you solve it in all other places, you, know, you haven't done anything, it's going to come back. So as you talk about other places, advocating in other places, that's what I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. That's right. We do do some work in, in Ghana. Uh, okay. There's something called the COVAX facility. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Gavi Alliance. Uh, not yet. I have some friends there. In fact, the health minister is my friend. But when, I haven't talked to him lately. But, uh, maybe, maybe we could have a, a discussion offline. Uh, sure. There's a there's a big effort to make sure that... Um, and th this, is, this is where, you know, some of the the disparities are, are bothersome because um, there's an effort to ensure that at least health providers get access to the vaccines. Yeah. But mm -hmm. this, is, this is a real ethical dilemma because if you look at you know, where the need is, it's everywhere, yeah. all over the world. 
So right. you take care of certain communities by, you know, feeling good and, and getting, you know, a very small percentage of the population covered. But meanwhile, you know, here in the US, we're, we're working towards getting every single person vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say that's wrong, necessarily, but it's something that we, we need to reflect on. You know, where are we making sure that we're making a difference? And this is one of the biggest challenges with vaccines, even in our own communities, we should not be feeling good about, you know, vaccinating the majority of people that have good access to care, you know, can take care of themselves, can access, you know, antibodies if they, if they need it or things like that while communities that are really, you know, having a lot of underlying conditions, greater risk of disease, probably are going to the hospital too late when they do get disease. We shouldn't be stopping and being satisfied that we're getting, you know, 50% of the population when it's really maybe 70% of, 75% of the population that probably has lower risk. And then the part of the population that really needs it still isn't vaccinated because that's where the disease will continue to spread. And that's where we're all at risk. So you, you said you know, something that's really important is that you know, unless all of us are protected, none of us are protected. And we need to recognize how interconnected we all are you know, think about who is running, you know, our transportation system, all of our infrastructure, who's, you know, in restaurants, you know, delivering our food, you know, taking care of all of these services that we use every day. If we lose people, we've lost, you know, our society. And so we've got to stop feeling comfortable that, that we've, you know, the people around us have been vaccinated when others that really need it still need to be protected. So, you know, I, I just encourage everybody to use your voice as much as possible, be an advocate for the people that really, uh, really need the vaccine it makes sure that systems in place to be able to get the vaccines. You know, one of the biggest assets we have around our local churches to be able to bring vaccine closer to the community, you know, to do different drives to help people get to where they need to get to, or maybe even find appointments, things like that. So there's a lot of things that, that could be done to make sure that we're protecting, you know, everybody in our community to protect all of us.